Good afternoon. Solar Quarter, Asia's largest screen tech media firm, is pleased to welcome everyone virtually to an exclusive webinar in collaboration with Centhawk on how digital tools are transforming construction of solar PV power plants. In this session today, we will look specifically at the intersection of solar PV and digitalization and assess how new te digital technology can be applied to solar. Let's look at new and improved business models, the digitalization of the entire PV value chain from manufacturing to operations and maintenance, and the use of smart technology to better integrate the technology into the grid. With this, we will first start with our techno-commercial presentation by Mr. Rahul Sanke, who is a co-founder and president at Sensoc. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Sangeeta. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am the president and co-founder of uh, Sensoc. Uh, Sensoc is a digital technology startup uh, that's focused on um, enabling use of advanced digital tools uh, to improve uh, efficiency and effectiveness across um, uh, the entire life cycle uh, for various stakeholders in the solar space. Uh, what I will do is uh, very quickly walk through a short presentation um, and then um, we can have uh, uh, you know, a good discussion uh, with other experts um, in, in the field uh, from Sterling Wilson, um, LNT and SoftBank Energy, who are all using um, these types of tools um, and they can talk about and share their own experiences. Okay, you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so a quick introduction to Sensoc. Uh, we are a global uh, startup um, headquartered in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, but um, a very uh, you know large uh, and strong uh, development center here in Bangalore, and uh, soon uh, to be um, set up uh, office and development center in Abu Dhabi. Uh, as I mentioned, our goal is uh, is to help uh, you know use basically advanced digital tools to uh, improve uh, processes, help improve uh, asset performance, and you know reduce costs uh, over the entire uh, solar life cycle. Um, so we started this in, in journey in 2018. Actually, we started a bit earlier, but um, formally uh, got incorporated in 2018, and I've helped um, you know over 80 customers um, use our solutions um, across 400 plus sites and assets. Uh, so we have a range of applications on the platform. It's a, it's a broad-based uh, software as a service platform uh, with uh, various applications that include drone data analytics applications, um, uh, which include Terra, I, and Therm. Uh, Terra is a pre-construction uh, tool uh, which uses drone data for topography um, uh, and terrain analytics. Um, I is a construction management solution that again uses drone data uh, and uh, AI to um, uh, detect, monitor, help monitor uh, progress and quality parameters on site. Uh, Therm is a, uh, is a thermography um, tool using uh, basically uh, for detection of hotspots uh, using drone-based uh, infrared thermography. And then we have a couple of applications that integrate with these uh, which are more workflow and productivity applications. <clears throat> so there is a task management solution called Desk. Um, there's a document management solution uh, called Vault um, and a mobile app that helps uh, access um, information, all this information on sites uh, conveniently. And I've also- on 20 plus countries and have inspected well over a thousand assets worldwide. Our clients range across the solar I'm sorry for that, sir. Uh, requesting all the participants to please kindly mute themselves. I repeat, requesting all the participants to mute themselves. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have a global uh, footprint. Um, uh, we Our solutions have been used in assets across 15, over 15 countries and 400 plus sites. And 
cumulatively in terms of capacity, um, uh, they haven't used um, across uh, over 28 gigawatts of um, assets um, uh, in, in multiple locations. So, um, you know, construction in general and, and for solar has a lot of challenges. Um, one, of course, is increasing plant sizes, as, uh, you know, our other speakers uh, on this uh, um, webinar will, will, will certify uh, plants are really becoming very large in size, uh, spread over thousands of acres. Um, and typically, um, you know, construction timelines are actually shrinking um, uh, between six months to 12 months um, is, is what uh, you have to build um, these plants in. Uh, and then you, of course, have the continuous cost pressure um, uh, that you have to deal with, right? So uh, there are several sort of challenges uh, that compound this one is access to accurate data uh, from the site. There's still a lot of paper-based data capture, um, uh, whether it's related to quality, inventory, or progress monitoring. Um, then, you know, in, in response to certain data, how do you drive effective you know, site actions across such a large, uh, large site? Um, it also requires collaboration, uh, which is a challenge. Um, I mean, you essentially use uh, Excel emails and meetings as a current tool, um, but there need to be more effective solutions that can uh, enable this. And then uh, most of these sites are also remote. Uh, so travel is, is a constraint, especially in um, today's uh, COVID um, uh, scenario. Uh, and, and if you look at statistics in general, this is what uh, you know, uh, agencies um, and companies that have done research um, have certified that construction management is one of the most or the least digitized uh, solutions um, or areas uh, globally. Um, and the estimate is uh, this is you know from a study done by McKinsey where um, you know they estimated that a digital transformation of construction can actually improve productivity up to 15 percent and help reduce costs by four to six percent. Um, now, currently, as far as solar is concerned, uh, there really aren't uh, you know cohesive sort of platforms and tools available. There is a, a range of tools that is used today. Um, across uh, the life cycle, but um, there really aren't solutions that you know integrate everything together. So that is one of the key, uh, in our opinion, that's one of the key uh, requirements to ensure that uh, ensure adoption of all these tools uh, and get the maximum benefit um, from these solutions. So one of the approaches that uh, we have uh, taken while building our platform is uh, what is called a digital twin uh, based uh, uh, data model. Um, digital twins um, are something that is relatively new in the <clears throat> infrastructure um, domain, but they have been used uh, for some time um, by uh, the likes of uh, GE, Siemens, and so on. And the idea really is that you have, uh, you know, multiple data sources um, uh, and uh, in for data coming in from uh, different functions, different teams uh, working on, on the project. Uh, and the idea is that uh, if you know have a single sort of a platform that uh, integrates all these data streams and captures this um, uh, in a manner that uh, is indexed to the digital twin of the asset. Uh, so you have automatic referencing of this data to specific, let's say, inverter blocks, uh, you know, tables, strings, and so on. Um, uh, so it, it automatically organizes data uh, in, in that fashion. Um, we strongly believe that a digital twin approach is actually um, the future of how um, you know things will move forward. And uh, you know this is something that uh, was uh, slated as a top ten hot technology trend in in 2019 um, by you know Gartner, SAP, uh, IBM, etc. As I mentioned, it is um, the likes of GE and Siemens have been using this in, in aircraft engines, um, you know turbines. Um, manufacturing equipment and so on. Um, so what is a digital twin? Essentially, it's a, you know, a software um, pattern or a data organization model um, that uh, creates a virtual representation of, um, of your asset on, on, uh, on the cloud. Um, and it basically keeps growing over a period of time as more and more data flows into the platform. There are a few levers in our opinion that are important from a construction um, uh, you know, for streamlining uh, or digitalizing construction. Uh, the first lever is, is um, what we call digital twin based data organization. So the idea is to use, uh, you know, the GIS um, uh, based uh, layouts 
um, of, for the plant uh, to organize data and information and use that for effective collaboration between uh, various teams. Um, so if you can store documents um, and um, uh, you know attach to specific components in the digital model, that makes it easy to access, retrieve, and and um, uh, you know even share and collaborate with other other team members rather than uh, exchanging lots of emails um, uh, on on and storing documents on shared drives where you don't know necessarily where something is kept or where it's lying. The second uh, lever is uh, using drones uh, and um, artificial intelligence uh, for uh, remote monitoring and management of data. So. Um, the idea is simple, you use drones to uh, collect uh, images and then you process these images and use uh, machine learning based algorithms to detect key features, um, generate counts, uh, and also measure some quality parameters. Um, so that's that's the second lever that uh, is important uh, for digitalization of construction. The third lever is uh, really using mobile devices and apps um, uh, you know, on site. Uh, so moving away from pen and paper to using rugged devices, whether it's phones or tablets, uh, and then having the relevant apps to allow you to uh, not just capture information from site effectively, like, uh, you know, um, capture, uh, fill out checklists and so on from the site, but also um, access information uh, when on site, uh, right? So accessing documents and critical uh, data uh, easily from your uh, tablet or mobile device. The fourth lever is uh, really implementation of a digital workflow across the office and site. So the idea is to uh, ensure that, you know, you move away from emails and, you know, lots of conversations uh, and meetings to uh, a more structured um, task management solution um, that is easy to use both uh, in the office and, and on the field. The fifth lever is really around document uh, management. Uh, documents, uh, I mean, there are lots of documents that, that get generated over, um, over the you know, development and construction phase and different teams need access to this information. Uh, some of the documents also undergo changes over a period of time, especially let's say design drawings, um, uh, iterations happen. So you need to have a cohesive way of managing this and also communicating, uh, communicating this to you know, other teams uh, that, have, uh, that are impacted by you know, changes in this documentation. So using, that's, that's one of the other key levers to, uh, for digitalization. And finally, uh, it's about capturing construction data and quality data in, in one place. Um, so moving away from Excel-based checklists where data sits, um, you know, once, once you have looked at it once, uh, a few years later, if you want to access that information, it's, it's very difficult to retrieve. And uh, it's also even more difficult to analyze in a meaningful way. Um, so, you know, how can you capture um, all this data in a, in a cohesive manner in databases where you can query it uh, effectively and uh, run analysis? This includes even, uh, you know, capturing and mapping all the component serial numbers to specific locations in the plant, uh, doing a, you know, as-built versus design analysis, um, capturing all the quality data in one place, using digital tools to manage punch list, and then effectively ensuring that you have a you know, well-organized information and data that can be handed over to, um, to uh, the ONM and asset management teams in a seamless uh, manner. Um, so this is the final, um, you know, final lever, and these six levers, in our opinion, um, you know, sort of constitute the, the complete um, elements of digitalization that will help uh, improve um, uh, improve construction management uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much sir, for the valuable insights. Uh, with this, uh, we will proceed ahead uh, with the panel discussion. The topic of panel discussion is going to be is digitalizing construction of solar PV plants, developers and EPC perspectives. We have fashion experts who have joined us. Uh, Rahul sir is already there with us. Uh, we have Mr. Vidal Patel, who is a VP sales from Talk, who would also be moderating today's session. We have Mr. Manoj Deorakar, who is the CIO at Sterling and Wilson. We have Mr. R. Narsiman Ayer, who is the Director of Operations from SV Energy. We have Mr. Shaji John, who is the Head Business Development, Domestic and Global Markets. Renewables Businesses at LNT Construction. 
And we have Ms. Sonia Swami, who is the head of IT and application engineering from O2 Power. Now, I would like to hand over the session to Mr. Vidal Patel, who will take it forward with other speaker panelists. Requesting all the speaker panelists to kindly switch on their cameras and unmute them. Thank you. Thanks, Sangeeta. So, uh, I would, uh, as, as per the agenda, I would like to invite Mr. Devrukar, uh, who is a CIO at Sterling Wilson. Uh, Mr. Devrukar is going to be sharing his insights on uh, how the digitalizing solar construction site activities using uh, various digital tools or mobile apps, tablets, and productivity tools. So, Mr. Devrukar, I would like to uh, invite you and if you can share a brief introduction about the back, about yours and then can share your insights on the topic for the today. Uh, thank sir, you very much. Please, sir. Sir, can you please proceed with the polls first uh, before sir shares his insights? Sir? Sure. Yeah. So why don't you uh, start with the first poll question? So it's engaging for the participants as well. Absolutely. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, good afternoon as per Indian time. And uh, thank you very much for uh, you know this opportunity to really meet such a large audience, which is coming from various walks of industry, which is related to, uh, to solar. Uh, Sterling Wilson has been uh, in the solar construction and O&M for more than a decade now. And uh, we are the largest EPC contractor in the world uh, with a portfolio which is, you know, which is in uh, ahead of 10 gigawatt as far as the construction is concerned and almost equivalent on a VNM. Uh, so I, 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 I'm looking at this uh, particular poll which is really coming up uh, and while everybody is kind of responding to that, uh, see solar construction and, and ONM operations and maintenance are two different worlds altogether. And when we talk about digitization, uh, the approach that one takes for both these are going to be different. Uh, obviously, today's focus will keep it more in terms of the EPC, uh, construction part of it, uh, but it has a large bearing in terms of making your operations and maintenance also successful, both in terms of transition and then it's uh, you know life cycle management. And very importantly, how well it is done depends upon the efficiency and the operationals uh, you know, productivity of the plant after the construction. Uh, I think some of the points which are very peculiar to solar construction have already been touched upon. Typically, nobody builds solar plants in the middle of the city. So those are always in a, you know, very inaccessible uh, locations over a very large area, which is uh, many times a very difficult terrain. And a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, Preparation has to, has to go in terms of studying the climatic conditions, the radiance, uh, the lay of the land, and very importantly, the grid, which is really going to be receiving your generation. After having done that, then the whole focus comes on to how quickly and how effectively you can actually make this uh, entire construction. Uh, to me, all these uh, you know, six uh, different, you know, tracks, which Rahul has very beautifully, you know, captured are going to be very, very relevant for solar uh, construction sites. Uh, but very importantly, it is, it is crucial for any EPC company to tie it down together so that there's no duplication of silos of data and data is seamlessly flowing from one application to other application. Uh, which actually determines the accuracy and also the speed at which you can do the construction. And construction is all about speed. We have virtually, uh, you know, kind of dealt with every track that is that was mentioned here. And I think there's a large opportunity, whether it is drones, which is AI-based, you know, analysis of construction. Uh, the mobility part of it is so crucial for solar uh, because at the end of the day, it is uh, the reality is the the person, the feet on the ground and how effectively they are facilitated to be able to capture the information, access the information and use it for a fast construction is going to be very, very important. Documentation obviously is a very, very important part of it because your entire contractual obligation 
along with your speed of construction and accuracy depends on occupant so to me i think each of the strata which has been mentioned in the in the presentation by rahul is very much relevant and extremely crucial for the epc industry to be able to digitize and move it faster see with the uh, i think solar industry had a good run so far and it will continue to be there but the competition is also going to be very very important and the clients are going to be more and more demanding and it's up to all of us in this particular domain to embrace digitization and create that competitive differentiator in terms of your services and very importantly the value that is delivered back to the customer so i will stop here uh, and i'll be happy to take any more questions at the end of the uh, at the prescribed this which is there uh, I'll, i'll give it back to the uh to shankita uh veera sir you can take it forward yeah Th thanks mr devrakar uh, i think uh, when you started you hit the nail right on its head that uh, efficiency of the construction uh, can be best measured by how productive the asset is at uh, asset management stage so with this uh, notes i would like to invite our next speaker for the day uh, mr uh, ayer who heads project construction at softbank mr ayer uh, very good afternoon and i would leave the mic to you to introduce and share your inputs on the topic yeah uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity so i've been uh, uh, in this solar uh, business for the last 10 years I remember the day when uh, we from Schneider were doing the first 5 megawatt plant uh, that took more than 7 months so now if you see the rate run rate is more than 5 megawatts a day so you know so that's the kind of uh, you know speed and uh, uh, you know voluminous it has become over a period of time so as i have seen in my this one and everybody sees is and as rahul had also presented one of the biggest challenges is like now it's i mean it's growing like you know it's i mean voluminous it's growing it's vast areas i remember once when i was attending way back one of the you know seminars when people were saying that in a solar plant it's like if anything goes wrong it's like finding a needle in the haystack you know it's something like you know and now i can recall that when you are building you know on acres and acres you can segregate two different activities one is which is mass and replicated and the other one which needs precision and that's very less actually so here if you go wrong anywhere any time uh then it's a big you know you just don't have anything to go back so the the whole crux around the whole game is like first time right you need to be first time right you need to have a precision to move at a high pace speed we have seen sometimes when we go on the road that death rides the speeding driver but here you have to speed and you have to see that you are i mean you reach safely and the only way is to you know embrace uh, all these new tools and digitization the only thing i mean it's it's big challenge right from the beginning like it's not so we are integrating a system you know and it's not a factory and these are all remote areas and you know you have a social obligation to give a lot of you know opportunities to the locals and they are not you know trained and you know so you will have to make systems and workability full proof technically so how do you do that so these are the tools which really bring in those and enable our enablers to that and help us achieve you know those peaks if you still see as rahul has pointed out i could see that large plant takes longer time i don't see that large plants are invariably also you know maybe taking a longer time to finish but they are given the same time to get finished you know for a large plant to get constructed it is from the time you hit the ground till the time you commission it's about not more than 7 months maximum sometimes you are under pressure to do it even under 6 months and you know um, with everything now getting precise and uh, pre i mean precision oriented the, the the people who are at the back end are calculating every single day like the day you know you will want 100% production 
and there is a auto process which all comes from the wind which says that you you know hand it over but you never see a plant getting generated on the same day you know it takes about minimum 60 days 50 days to stabilize depending upon how big is it so it's all the more essential that you know when we are into such a mass scale we are having you know men machine tools to see to it that we go at a top speed we don't commit errors we are in a position to do the hoto in a very right way and see to it that, that there is a very little dissonance left between the expectations of the client as well as the epc who so builds or even if it is a self epc the teams who build by themselves vis a vis their own teams who take over i mean it's it's a lot of skirmishes even between them it's not very easy and because you know uh, so it's all the more like you i mean anything that starts well ends well so the construction is the first you know it like you hit the ground where in all your expectations your design whatever you thought on the paper is you know touching the ground to really take off and that has to be highly precise so these kind of technologies you know they enable they are very big enablers and you know um, the people at the same time have been in a position to you know really catch up to them that's why you can see now the prices you know as the way the tariffs are going down on one side you have technologies which are enabling you but at the same time you know the mass replication and all are going and go, i mean they are getting better and better the, the more you have first time rights the more you see that you are able to train uh, the locals in a way that they can go and you know you use some local kind of a six sigma to see to it that whatever the error you know they you keep on training them you can see that the errors go down and as in the auto process if you are able to bring down the time between the day you commission to hand it over properly you can see the plant even generate faster and add to your top line so it's very very important and that's what i would say so that's from me and i am ready to take any other questions from my experience we have been using you know sensoc uh, you know a couple of uh, applications they have been quite useful to us and the only thing like you know we we also had to basically you know um, train our people and all to see to it that they catch up so it's it's a bit synergy between the application the people who as an end user uses as well as the epc clients like they also use like we have sterling wilson and they are using primavera with us so we are always scheduling uh, projects on primavera and uh, i mean in a way if you see we are almost you know maybe about 50 to 60% where we should be but still there is a long way to go and the challenge is like every time you go to a new site you have a, the new locals and you have to change i mean train them and then do so i am sure that you know we are all humans and no one is perfect and everything tends towards perfection and that's where we are all here for we continue to improve to see to it that we have tools which uh, enables to our uh, in our endeavor to reach and tend towards anything we do as a perfect stuff so that's from my side thank you thank you mr ayer uh, for your valuable insights i think again one of the same Uh, point which Mr. Devrukar started, and you also kind of uh, validated it that the importance of the plant construction is directly visible at the asset management stage, right from the day the hoto process is till the time of stabilization. And some of the other valuable points to take home is how we can bring in the local ecosystem of the people who are there, right? The local field people, how we can train them and ensure uh, they are also taken into the fold. also more as a societal commitment that's also something fairly worthwhile to ponder on that how can we make tools to even have them on board where their ability to catch up with okay. the new stuff is uh, uh, fast tracked so i think with this i would like to invite mr shaji john our next speaker he has been heading solar at larsen and tubro since i think easily more than a decade uh, good afternoon mr shaji uh, all yours Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, is it uh, clear? I think the voice is. I hope it is clear. Um, yes. So it is. I will not take much time. Um, 
quickly i will divide my talk into three parts one is what is industry needing uh, today and uh, what lnt has been doing in this digital space and very specifically what lnt renewables have been doing in digital space so this will be the three parts so industry needs like rahul in the beginning touched up, touched upon the scale of the plants are going up today we are talking about some of the projects especially in middle east what we are working is 1 gigawatt to 3 gigawatt scale that is the range of projects which uh, we are today uh, in discussion with various uh, customers and the targets are not very very, very big so they are still in the range of 18 months to 36 months this 1 to 3 gigawatt which means that you are under time pressure come to the tariff in india itself we have seen 2 rupees uh, in the last week in the bid and in middle east it is almost a rupee uh, the last discovered tariff in middle east is 1.35 cents or even below which works out to roughly 1 rupee so that is the pressure on the cost um, so this time and cost pressure is actually very difficult uh, to manage in a large scale plant but good thing is that solar is very repetitive very modular technology and the construction activities can be very repeated so if we digitalize this then there is a lot of productivity improvement which is possible and that is where i think digital technologies are going to help uh, this industry reach a productivity level which like narsimhan i have told uh, the scale and pace with which every day we can add the capacity goes up so that is the importance uh, of digital in solar industry now one more important thing uh, we have to keep in mind is that when we do this digitalization this is a industry which is still in a nascent stage in my view though we have 10 year old in india at least but still it is long way to go when we are talking about by 2050 and all the entire world will be renewables so to prepare the world for that timeline and that we capture this data and use it for future improvements in the design and construction process and the material handling for every single construction process which will be there plus don't forget the asset management in a few point this data is very important to understand how the components behaves how the certain part of the plant behaves so that you can take corrective preventive action so that you don't lose on the generation so these are some of the industry needs and what uh, what is the data around this digitalization uh, for which reason we are all here today to talk coming to the second point which i wanted to talk was lnt what lnt is doing in this space so lnt's digital tra uh, travel started at least 4 or 5 years back when our ceo starting started speaking about digitalization what he did was that he started uh, putting sensors in all resources when i am telling all resources in in construction industry we understand resources from lmp labor material plant so wherever resources are there even it is on a labor's uh, helmet why don't you put a sensor there so that you can capture the data related to this resources so that you understand the behavior of the resources the productivity of the resources and you can then use it for improving the productivity of these resources that was started and then a set of people almost around 100 people started working on it on all sort of construction activities not just renewables we are talking uh, generally on the construction of buildings and uh, roads railways um, hydel plants what what are sort of projects we are doing in most of those plants and today what happened is that lnt has created a vertical called lnt next and um, this is basically providing digital solutions especially for the construction industry so that is what lnt has been doing coming specifically to what lnt renewables our business has been doing in this space um like narsimhan told our first uh, sort of experience was with sensoc in softbank project of uh, construction monitoring uh, through um, drones and uh, having digital tracking of the progress of the project that was one of our early experience in our view uh similar exercise uh, across lnt we are doing called prapti um, there is another name to it a smaller name called bodhi basically it is to digitalize way of monitoring the progress from baseline construction schedule how the actual construction is happening today it is more or less fed by the engineers uh, to 
put the progress into the apps and uh, then the management or anybody can see it and take corrective action to control the project. But maybe Sensoc has uh, understood uh, better technology to see uh, from the drones how to capture the progress and uh, get it into direct monitoring. So maybe that is uh, something we have to further improve it in our, in our system. So that is the first thing. Second is uh, uh, we are using uh, drone-based surveys especially for bidding purposes. We are mostly trying to do that so that uh, we understand the site very well and take care of all site related inputs while do, we are doing the costing and making proposal to our clients. That is the second uh, digital work we are doing. Third is our digital stores. Basically uh, to track the material, uh, the materials uh, which are required for the certain work packages and uh, maybe contractor wise, uh, how much material has gone and how to do the reconciliation. So they are also digitalized in many of our project sites. Fourth thing is quality and safety records are also digitalized in terms of the root cause analysis are generally put on the uh, digital space so that it can be used in the future for um, tracking this uh, or improving the quality root cause analysis for the new set of problems which we are facing. And then NCRs which are issued how to attend to that and close it on time. So these are certain quality and safety related digitalization, which we have done. Finally, we are working on some of the futuristic uh, digitalization, like how to do uh, automated augering so that whatever drone is capturing the survey data, feed it in the machines and then see that the uh, augering and the ramming can happen uh, as much as automated as possible. And then the alignment of the structures, how to do it automated. These are some future uh, digital activities which we are yet to start. Uh, then very importantly, we are also working on a uh, drone come uh, automated module cleaning system. Today, robots are running on the uh, structures, uh, which is independent, but how we can use drones to uh, have lesser number of robots, uh, which will pick up and drop it on the nest tables. So those are the certain futuristic work which we are doing. So this is all from my end. So uh, thank you for the opportunity and we can talk more about it. Sure, thanks, thanks Mr. John for uh, highlighting your viewpoint and also what are the things that LNT is doing to kind of uh, leapfrog the digital technologies under construction. LNT I think has been synonymous with any construction act Activity that happens in India and across now the Middle East as well. So it was great having you, your viewpoint. So with this, uh, what I would I would like uh, Solar Quarter to post few poll questions so that maybe people can respond and they don't have to uh, while the speaker is there. So can we have the next poll question? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Vidal. I'm just launching the poll now. Sure. Uh, Uh, this is the last poll that we have. I can please have already shared the uh, results of earlier poll. Okay, sure. So with this, I would like to invite our uh, next speaker, Ms. Uh, Swami. She heads technology at O2 Power. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Swami. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. So, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. And this has been really nice and very insightful hearing from everyone. So I think we all, uh, you all have been really experienced in the same industry and uh, getting to know more and more experiences is adding up and collating more, uh, identifying it, you know, making a better system altogether. So going back to the inputs that Rahul started with, uh, understanding the kind of system and digital applications currently available to make a more robust and, uh, you know, a strong system, which can actually provide the analytics really accurate and ensures that the ROI, uh, anticipated ROI can be met with the better results and answer. So moving ahead, needless to say that the quality of these applications and the quality of the data and evaluations, whether we have robots or we have drones, it's really important. Now, understanding uh, 
you know the panels specifically let's uh, i'll take one example of panels and the quality of panels with the myriad of the vendors which are available throughout and uh, understanding uh, you know a different variety and different quality is available in the market evaluation and checking the right fault at the right time you, you know is very important drone i suppose and robots i suppose has been really helping in that area wherein we can rapid you know we can be really rapid and easy to to verify and check the rooftop and arrays and also uh, at times it's the hotspot identification that we have and drone drones have got the thermal cameras associated now wherein we can evaluate a large scale a large plant and then we can focus on the right area we can have those dots and highlighted infrared facilities through which we reach to the core and make it happen so this is how i think that yes uh, the uh, moving towards the drone drones and robots is really important to have and planning at each stage specifically planning and executing at each stage identifying the gaps and having a well capable team evaluating these steps right there and then is the critical is the key to success so i think with this uh, i'm happy to address more questions if needed sure thank you miss swami so i think with this we already had uh, insights from the speakers and uh, uh sangeet uh, sangeeta can we have uh, questions from the audience maybe you can announce uh, the we will start taking the questions from the audience and maybe a few questions that we have internally amongst ourselves uh hi sir just the side uh yeah so hi ajas Yeah. So, sir, attendees have already started posting their questions in Q and A box. Okay. So, if you can take it a uh, few questions from there and post that, we can have a live Q and A session with the audience, in which audience can uh, ask the questions uh, directly to the speakers. Then, so first on the okay. go, we can have few questions which are written in the chat box. Sir. Sure. So, I think the first question is uh, comes from Prashant Acharya. Uh, do we have drone based system to capture module soilage for large scale plants constructed in arid regions he specifically wants uh, rahul to answer that but i think rahul and then maybe other panelists uh, would like to maybe rahul you can go first yes <clears throat> yeah so uh, soiling uh, detection is a little bit tricky uh, using drones um, in principle uh, gross uh, levels of soiling where you have a lot of dust accumulation happening can be detected with drones um i think the challenges come from uh, the confounding effects of uh, you know reflections uh, because sometimes uh, reflections will also look like um, look like a soiled uh, uh, you know panel um and that uh, sort of fools uh, the algorithm if you are trying to do use automated detection because uh, for large sites you do want to use machine learning based algorithms uh, for detection purposes um so those algorithms then get uh, you know um confused um in terms of um uh, detection between what's a reflection uh, versus you know a soil uh, panel uh, but we have been able to uh, you know pick up uh, soiling it's just that it's not 100% reliable so uh, i would uh, maybe mr shaji since you are also doing quite a bit of uh, drone based robotic and that work would you like to share your views on this no i fully agree with uh, what rahul told it is too early for us to get into a system which can detect the soiling so accurately through drone uh, frankly speaking today on ground measurement of soiling itself is challenging we don't see it uh, as a regular practice in the industry to have soil measurement kits in fact our team has been uh, developing this kit so that on ground we measure how much is the soiling and when the trigger for cleaning can start so maybe uh, in uh, years to come we will have that system uh, but right now i don't believe it is there i don't have knowledge that it is operating drone based uh, soil measurement system all right right fair point <clears throat> so yeah i think maybe if we can unmute the participants and if they want to go live uh, to audio to ask questions to the panelists uh, they can do so ajas if can we unmute participants hello uh, 
participants uh, who wa wants to ask questions directly to the panelists, they can unmute themselves and ask the questions to the panelists. I think there's a next question from Amitabh, which is in terms of the condition monitoring of equipments. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, can I take this question? Sure, sure. Yeah, Mr. Devrakar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think the predictive and the condition-based monitoring of equipment uh, is going to be very important as a part of uh, operations and maintenance, uh, you know, part of the uh, life cycle of your, your plant, which is there. Uh, it can be done in two ways, and I will also share what we have been able to do it. Uh, if you have something called as a as a computerized monitoring system (CMS), uh, which actually monitors your plant performance as it is, as long as the sun, you know, is uh, is there, uh, you get the generation, and thereafter, after the radiance goes down, you have a fairly flat. Uh, this. During this particular point of time. The CMS system should be capable, and and of course there are models which are available, which tells you if any of the equipment is misbehaving, it is actually going out of the parameters, and that can obviously trigger something called as an alert for uh, instituting uh, an incident or a request for a maintenance which is there. Now over a period of time, if you capture uh, the performance parameter of your critical equipments. Then obviously, uh, with a with the use of uh, ML or even for that matter AI, you should be able to predict uh, a deterioration of a particular performance and create an alert to your team on the ground to be able to actually do a maintenance uh, you know incident which is there. Alternatively, your field staff uh, which is which is on the ground. Uh, Obviously, can do visual inspection and you know kind of uh, do that, but that's not the very elegant way of doing it. There are many tools which are available which can actually capture the performance and uh, and kind of trigger a condition based uh, maintenance request uh, and go on with. This is something that I have come across. Sure. So as a, I think uh, from, we can have one from a developer's perspective, Mr. Ayer or Ms. Swami, would you also like to share insights as a, from the developer's shoes? Yeah, it's also like, see, as technology is coming up, catching up, it depends on uh, which phase of that you really enter. Normally, if you see the technology which is emerging is quite costly. And the way the tariffs are going down in each one is, you know, I've seen normally the developers tend to be away from uh, a technology which has just come in until and unless there is a very, very distinct, you know, delta coming out of it in the form of some tangible uh, benefits. So what they see is as it, as it takes its own time to see that it stabilizes only then the costs come down and then they go for it. Like right now you have a lot of IoT tools. You've got already earlier itself there was a you know um, uh, there was a monitoring for every uh, junction boxes and because of cost factor they used to I mean the developers used to knock it knock it off whereas it was very essential but now they say that yeah, it's not essential like you know you have uh, you i mean now you need not have you've got fiber optics and you know and beyond fiber optics we can have even monitoring through Zigbee and all this, there are new new tools where, from which you can do. So IoT is available wherein, you know, even like, for example, I have seen a, a particular uh, device, a sensor and I mean device with ABB, which can even, you know, uh, talk about uh, a huge power transformers health status. And, you know, but that's, that's quite, you know, costly to invest in the beginning and the way the cutthroat, you know, um, uh, cost, I mean, costing is being done for tariffs and all. People are not willing to invest at the formative stages. And that's where, again, it goes back to this kind of a stuff. So it's basically technology should be, you know, uh, in a way that it's usable and it's affordable to see to it that, you know, people are 
able to get tangible benefits. But yeah, these kind of things are available. You've got IoT, I mean, uh, SCADA is available. You've got all devices. They can even wirelessly transmit the status of all these equipments, which are certainly a boon to the o and guy. He can think of reducing the cost of o and by not deploying too many heads, by seeing that, you know, they are remotely monitored and they have one particular guy who can have a, you know, access to that, that kind of a stuff, it can be worked out. But yes, these are all available, no doubt. They are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayer. I think uh, Ms. Swami would also like to add. Uh, sorry, ma'am. I don't think so. You are audible. Can you hear me better? Yeah, now we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Well, I wanted to mention that, yes, Mr. Ayer has actually covered it entirely end-to-end. -end, but from, if I talk about the ROI also, because when we are actually investing in such a huge project and talk about the ROI, which is anticipated, you know, having uh, the, po the possibilities of failures and issues have, which has not been addressed on time is the biggest fear for that matter. Now, I, I would like to go back to the example of drones that we were using. We understand having drones, robots, and the IOTs implementing and the SCADA and OEM operations, if effectively 30 to 50% of the cost which has been reduced and which has been actually proven being saved into all these operations throughout the years, throughout the last few years when these new technologies were being you know, innovated and then adopted. And from a very strong team and using these uh, power-packed digital applications around, this amalgamation, which actually strengthens this team to perform better, to bring the ROI and to have that uh, anticipated ROI back on the ground is the main key that we look forward. Going to the applications, which we just saw with Rahul, I and Terra, wherein we understand that yes, these are the GSI spaces and we can analytic, where we can actually analyze it better. We can have the data, entire data of all the applications being collated into one particular place and then can be transmitted into any kind of uh, different application way. This is the strength that we are currently looking at. Thank you, thank you. So I think the next question that we have is an interesting question. So uh, the question comes from Satish where uh, he is He's asking that how can we use digital technologies on the demand side data or demand side management? Uh, I think that's more on a regulatory front and those challenges. But yeah, I would like to leave it to panelists who would like to answer that. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, just one quick reaction uh, is that uh, there is definitely a uh, use case um, for digital technologies um, uh, for uh, you know grid integration uh, planning or i would say energy flow um, planning purposes uh, today um, i think the level of um, uh, you know use of digital technologies is sort of minimal it's probably just for monitoring purposes um, and uh, you know the processes for determining um, you know, whether a particular node can absorb certain energy or uh, doing the balancing there uh, are based on load flow analysis and so on, which is a, you know, I, I would say, a, you know, 60s, 70s kind of a, um, you know, determined uh, technique or uh, methodology. So uh, there is, in my mind, um, you know, there's definitely scope for this. It's just that it's not being, uh, it not being used. Uh, probably, uh, you know, the, the Siemens, uh, I mean, the companies in this domain, um, can uh, comment on that and some of the this is where the utilities have a big role to play um, and uh, it's really not uh, within the purview of the developer per se uh, but uh, it's more in the purview of the utility to adopt these solutions and uh, manage uh, energy flow better. Actually I would like to add a perspective here and this, this is a very interesting question uh, so if you just extend this particular query in terms of saying that okay demand side management uh, if you uh, look at some of the new configurations which are coming, these are coming for a multi-source energy contracting. And that would mean that we have a hybrid, uh, you know, kind of uh, situation where you got solar plant which generates during the day. You got, you know, alternative energies like wind or maybe cogen or a, a DG power plant which feeds in the night. 
and then there's a battery storage which is coming in. Uh, in fact, in the latest uh, global projects, uh, battery storage is more often than not a part of the solar, uh, which is coming up, which is there. And that makes it a very multi-tiered you know, architecture where at one point of time or at a one level, you have to actually manage the source, which can be solar or it can be battery or it can be you know, wind for that matter. And on the other hand, you have to actually find out what is the most economic model into which you can fit into the grid and also get the demand side from the grid. So these are very, very complex applications what Rahul already uh, mentioned. These are called the energy management system, EMS. Uh, but those are the ones which are getting introduced. Uh, there are of course large players and there are also startups. Uh, both are operating in this particular. But I think this is what is going to be the future uh, of our entire you know, digitization that is going to happen, especially around solar. So I will just quickly wind it up in one minute, my talk. Uh, we have a uh, live operating pilot in our campus in Chennai. So if anybody interested can come and see how we control the source and load both sides. So it is sort of a demand side management. So like uh, Manoj rightly told, there are multiple sources, solar, wind, and energy storage, uh, all three sources plus DG. Uh, these are the source and then there are loads. So in an in a environment called microgrids uh, or smart microgrids, uh, you may not have the grid available. So you have to manage with the source which is available, which is sun and wind. So in some cases, if there is a shortage of power, there need to be the load has to be shut down. So you have to identify the load into critical, non-critical uh, loads, and those non-critical loads has to be cut down. So we have a uh, microgrid controller, which is developed in-house, and this microgrid controller can uh, take such actions of demand side management. So this is in our Chennai campus, it is live. Anybody interested can come and see this. It's a futuristic technology. It is probably not financially viable today, but maybe five years down the line, you will see more, more and more of such uh, applications. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. John. So the next question that we have uh, is from Sarvanan. Who is these? Uh, I think. Um, his intent is asking uh, is what what is the current uh, cost impact which is considered or what is the outlay which is earmarked specifically for the projects to be spent on digital tools or technologies so i mean any any anything that you would like to add is it more like per project basis per megawatt basis per pro i think that's what he intends to ask So I think the, the perspective, uh, sorry, Raul, uh, you, you can go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead, please go ahead. So I think the perspective of digital cost for uh, a developer uh, and uh, APC contractor are going to be very, very different uh, because the, the basic financial models are different for both of them. So I can speak about the APC contracting companies. A project digital cost uh, essentially will, you know, consists of uh, three components. Uh, one is, uh, definitely the basic minimum infrastructure that you require, you require connectivity, you require, you know, uh, basic digital tools, uh, including your tablets, etc. all of that, uh, computers. The second is the cost of your backend, uh, you know, the backbones, systems like ERP and, you know, the Microsoft licenses and so on and so which is there, which these two costs more or less are governed by the corporate, uh, I would say, capability of managing those costs, which are there. Uh, and typically for an EPC company, these two costs are very, very small for EPC domain. I would say mostly it is less than 1% of your revenue. And I think that's the uh, logic that you can also put at a project cost level, which is there. The more interesting component is on the truly, uh, you know, the industry.4 or the what you call it, the EPC uh, 4.0, uh, which is about the new digital innovations which are coming IoT, AI, ML, uh, you know, the, the entire, this about the robotics, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, all of that, which is there. I think the cost base for that is not yet been stabilized. And it, you'll find a lot of variation uh, 
amongst the companies who are early adopters uh, versus the companies which are not yet you know kind of gone to that uh, but the good part of this component is that there's a very clear roi and hence i think depending on the project and project conditions uh, and the contracting uh, you will find a lot of variations Now, just to give an example in rajasthan or in, in middle east uh, the ambient temperature during the summers is so high that virtually the manual operations are going to be next to impossible and you must go for digital uh, you know alternatives like soil detection or model cleaning uh, and you will typically see that the percentage of digital budget is slightly on the high side and also in developed countries like australia or in us the regulations are such that you must have the digital capability so you'll find some variations uh, but over the period of time i think globally it will get uh, kind of standardized and you will see people more and more uh, solar plants actually adopting this digital tool because roi is very clear there. Yes, I one more yeah. thing, Arsimania. Like um, we were trying to do something in Saudi, and we, we man, did not proceed. But what we could see is it's also governed by the local laws and regulations, and the cost of manual labor and things like that. In India, you can still afford not to go robotics. You know, still you have water cleaning systems, old tankers coming and all. Wherein you know you've got a social responsibility for local villagers too. give them contracting and job and they can do this but uh, with these kind of huge plants which are coming up even they can ill for doing that and you know your uh, uh, return on investments i mean will not also reflect good if you adopt those kind of stuff uh, so you know it's it's all the more it's a compulsion you know depending upon the other kind of regulatory laws which you know forces you to get into that as a no option as an options choice so uh, it's better i mean we embrace them and then have a uh, you know see as to how we do social engineering or things like that so it's very important that we continue to catch up with these things yeah yeah i think i just reiterate that some of these costs are still evolving um, because the adoption itself is uh, evolving i think um, Uh, you know, companies uh, like L&T, Sterling Wilson, and so on are, uh, from a EPC side, are sort of leading the way. And then uh, we have already worked with SoftBank Energy um, and so on. So these these are sort of initial days uh, for uh, adoption of uh, all of these tools. Um, I would say, you know, version one of the tools, uh, the version 2.0, which which will include advanced tools like um, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, and so on. those are still you know far and few between in terms of adoption but by and large i think um, i mean you know the digital the cost overall cost of digital tools is unlikely to be um, you know very significant right because uh, digital technologies by default tend to be you know inexpensive i think the one, less than 1% kind of uh, ballpark number that uh, manoj mentioned I, i you would probably have everything you know far lower than that uh, at that overall level uh, as far as the overall cost of digitalization is concerned so uh, well, what we can do now is uh, we have received a lot of questions coming in from the attendees attendees uh, why don't you switch on your microphones and have you know live questions addressed to the speakers you know that would be great and we can have an interactive session So attendees, you can please go ahead one by one with your questions, and you can you know ask and put across your questions to the speakers, please. So I think we have a next question from Shantanu, and uh, this is a question which uh, I do get posed a lot as, but I would uh, right now hold back myself from answering it because that's that's like a op very open-ended question, but still very pertinent to that. so shantanu wants to ask that uh, considering the amount and sizes of the data i think like a typical scada data with something like 100 tags 200 tag itself the amount of data that gets generated is tremendous so when we are talking about data during the construction stage or pre development stage the amount of that data is going to be huge so his question is uh, 
what have we thought about storing analyzing maintaining and in fact i would like to add not only about just storing analyzing maintaining it uh, there is an issue related to uh, the specifically on the regulatory framework of the data because we are specifically talking about uh, very large important assets even from a national standpoint of view though they are owned by developers uh, scrubbing the data a lot of times that we observe the data coming in there is junk data because sometimes the connectivity is broken or not so i think the pointed question how do we how do we think or what have we done about handling this large volume of data or big data as we call it so i think mr devrukar uh, would you like to go first yes yes um, so uh, i think the total data volumes especially after you put on something like iot uh, is unimaginable it's kind of no way you can imagine the uh, amount of data which is coming uh, there are two definite trends that we see and we all are you know falling into this that this data more often than not is going to the cloud now it can be a private cloud that is uh, based on the preference by a particular client or it can be a you know public cloud where it goes there uh, the whole aspect of designing this solution where you have uh, you know the iot data raw data coming in then you go need to aggregate that data you need to have a, a kind of a backup of that particular data uh, providing that data for and data in motion you know kind of a uh, analytics that you really want to run uh, what you want to decipher out of data data then storing that data for your analytics over a period of time and getting those insights which are there and finally having the data that is of no use uh, so for each of these stages what we typically do is to create a different kind of a contracting with the cloud providers where your cost of actually operating uh, the cold data is is very 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 small it's a like in amazon they call it a s3 bucket and then you got a you know a proper data which is under analysis and the data which is coming in uh, which is there uh so you need to have elasticity in your uh, uh, you know your architectural design now it means that you you have to keep it scalable at the same time you have to make sure that there is an adequate amount of uh, you know capacity which is available uh, because your volume can go up and down uh, depending upon how the plants are you know firing up uh, which are there and very importantly the economics of doing all of that is going to be very important and hence you need to have a very large store for your past data the historical data you need to have a sufficiently large store for your data which is currently being analyzed or the insights are being taken and then there is a large uh, you know channel into which your iot data is coming up uh, you know continuously so something like you got a if you got a string inverter versus a you know a normal inverter a data magnitude can be one is to you know maybe 20 maybe 40 at times which are there uh, so you got to really align it to your plant design and create the buckets which are according to that now this is just about iot now you add to that the drones you add to that the digital uh, you know uh, data which is getting punched from your mobile uh, devices now all of that has to be absolutely architected well and you need to provide for the data storages of all kinds as you do that uh, otherwise you may land up you know you know situation where it can be a technical challenge or it can be economic challenge both are there so uh, i think when you adopt a technology uh, all of that has to be absolutely uh, you know uh, designed and architected for next at least for 3 years and scalable to up to 5 years okay thanks thanks mr devrakar uh, i would say uh, any other panelist who would like to add on to this yeah i mean it's a it's a very important question um, uh, with respect to data management i don't think there are sort of clear um, answers i mean the good thing uh, as manoj also mentioned is that it's very inexpensive uh, to store data uh, these days um uh, especially on the cloud so you can accumulate but then there is also this risk of um, you know not bothering to really clean up 
um, data that you don't really need, right? Uh, which eventually over a period of time will add up um, and start adding uh, to costs uh, as well. Um, so there is, um, uh, you know, there is, I think it's, you know, for every organization to determine what is their exact data, you know, policy, right? Uh, if it's a developer that's going to own and operate the asset over the life cycle, they obviously would want to uh, want to ensure that historical data is available. Um, but again, to what extent do you need historical data? I mean, just one example is um, if you are monitoring uh, thermography data of, of uh, a, you know, of, or hotspots over a period of time, um, do you need to store two years worth of trends, three years worth of trends, 10 years worth of trends? Um, uh, it's something that uh, needs to be, uh, I don't think there's sort of a benchmark for this. Uh, it will probably be determined by, uh, you know, the behavior of the plant, uh, the policy that the company or you know the OM team uh, wants to adopt um, in terms of what they really need uh, from a management uh, perspective. Um, but I mean, all in all, I, uh, the data is going to continue to explode, and uh, I think the data center business is going to continue to thrive. <laughs> you know, as as, uh, absolutely, as absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Actually, there are two two more uh, you know perspective to the same question. I would like to add. Uh, so one, we talked about managing or storing the data, uh, but also is the performance power that is required out of your, you know, entire applications, which is going to, and that application power is going to be increasing all the time. The demand for that is going to increase because data is going to increase. You will have more and more complex, uh, you know, calculations. You talk about performance, you talk about, you know, uh, the performance against the targeted performance. And very importantly, getting the insights out of a huge volume of data. So when you talk about data storage, you also have to actually architect the performance that you expect out of uh, this. So it's not only infrastructure, it also the way your programs are uh, you know, designed by yourself or your partner, which is there. And the second point is that with this data, and this is a very critical data, both from uh, the national you know, security as well as the clients that we are dealing with, is the data security. And, and hence, it is also very important that at every stage of the data, whether it is from IoT or the firewall, which is, you know, kind of prevent all the, uh, or monitor this, right from there to the uh, networks, which is going to carry to the cloud, cloud entry point, your applications, your databases, your cold storage data, data lakes, if you have got it. There has to be a proper assessment of your risk, the vulnerability. And we also have to make sure that you're providing for adequate protections against that. Otherwise, you are in for a very big risk if it is not considered. Yeah, absolutely. I think security is a, is a number one um, you know, consideration. Uh, and it's important to ensure that um, providers um, have the relevant processes in place to um, uh, and, and systems and the architecture basically ensures uh, adequate security and there are standards, um, certification standards, ISO 27001, um, uh, you know, comp test for compliance uh, with respect to uh, data security and integrity. Uh, the US has a SOC 2 uh, systems uh, organization and controls um, certification, which has these five trust service principles. So uh, getting these uh, are ensuring that your processes are compliant with uh, with, you know, um, uh, meeting the standards uh, is, is very important from a security point of view. Yeah, so Mr. Mr. Ayer, Mr. Shaji, would you like to add uh, from, I think both the organizations again has uh, fairly long standing with terms of a lot of innovation as well as the data that you guys are handling. Yeah, I like to take this, like it's something like I like to have an analogy drawn in contracts we have called, a thing called say do. What did we say and what is what are we doing? So if you always see there is a, you know, the, the say and do are never one. I, say, I mean, it's not one at all. Like in contracts, we do say something. And if you really measure critical things, you're never at one. And similarly, like, you know, where did we set out to? We set out to make a plant with a, a particular expectation. So these are the kind of data now we have, which are now at least available with the ONM teams to see to it that if you 
analyze them properly like we need to know what is that we need to look in looking for what is the data we really need and in what way do we need to analyze and process uh, to see to it that we uh, are able to get uh, to the point that what we i mean we set out for something are we really achieving that or not and then this is what you know uh, really a uh, harbinger of you know uh, of the entire uh, system of uh, handling what data is really required what is that we can do away with and all that so i think these are all in a very uh, formative stage right now with iot and all having come in and so much of data pouring in now certainly the ondm groups of i feel most of the companies like from our point of view also i can say that we have now this build up going on at the same time we are also you know having a rock center wherein we are analyzing quite a few parameters which we like to see but there is always uh, to do a thing in a better way every day as the day passes you know so it's a very evolving stuff so this is what i would say like you know right now the whole uh, revolution has begun and in order to see that how much of data is pouring in and what all we do to really see it's still uh, yet to be worked out in a proper way i mean i think everybody is in an evolution curve i mean we are at least i can say that it's very interesting there's no end to creativity yeah all right yeah mr shaji yeah yeah so quickly two parts again uh, one is uh, what specifically in the solar uh, side we are doing uh, we had our own central monitoring system what we call uh, which connects all the projects which we are doing on end up so that is one data which we are capturing to see that uh, the plant met parameters are captured in terms of uh, how it is performing under various conditions and then the learning can be plugged back into our design system so that the new projects which we are designing and constructing take care of uh, those learnings this is one set of data which we were actually running it on our server and uh, today we believe that server may not be a good idea so we are now planning to switch this system into the uh, cloud based system so that is one set of uh, work which we are doing on the solar specific side second is as a company as a whole we have taken some initiative to uh, dig this uh, big data which we have generated over a period of several years now because lnt has been uh, implementing the what we call as eip uh, which is our in house developed portal for uh, entire construction management processes uh, mainly the material and procurement processes have much more data than any other Um, process so those data is now being picked up and uh, cleaned up and uh, analyzed and uh, thrown back into the system to uh, take the learning and uh, improve our uh, cost structure so that is a big exercise right now going on um, even the live data also is being compared across various businesses various geographies so somebody is purchasing cement in jammu and kashmir at certain rate the person purchasing in kanyakumari will online have the data so that efficiency is built across the company to have the best optimized pricing for that particular item so that is a level of data uh, data mining and data cleaning and data sharing is happening so that the productivity of the company as a whole improves oh that's that's another fairly uh, pertinent point that you've touched on the data mining aspect of it uh, mr shaji so i th- think uh, we don't have any more questions i would like to now since we have some time i would like to pose one of the questions that we came across so uh, the topic for the to- was digital tools for the construction management in the solar plant and most of the conversation that we have structured around is basically we as a either a epc or a developer but i would like to say step back and see another key ecosystem players that we have in the whole domain so one is basically lenders because most of these plants are basically debt financed and second ecosystem player which is again uh, pertaining globally that lot of times after a certain time frame once the asset is built you have the sale of that asset coming up so you have a new investor who is basically acquiring or buying these assets so from both these two roles uh, from a lender and from a say an acquirer's perspective how would the construction data i mean what kind of a data other than typically that we've seen across is the plant designs or autocad designs and those being shared 
they go back to the field to kind of validate verify either lender has lenders engineer going it or buyer has is some dd partner who goes there and kinds of tries and validates that so with this the topic that we have how do each one of you see how this this particular thing changing evolving or what should could be the vision that we can take forward for this thing yeah narsimanya i will take up yeah. this like you know uh, it's always that you know uh, these all lead to the kind of due diligence uh, which one has taken up during the construction period because they know that you know it's very 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 clear that um, a plant that is well constructed is uh, you know handed over in a proper way and performs well as an asset and in the oendm stage and uh, during its performance over a period of time has uh, fewer problems so i mean so if if one sees a plant maybe after 5 years uh, of its running from there itself one can gauge that you know what kind of a you know there are certain things which can uh, we are beyond beyond control and which can affect the performance of the plant there are with there are certain problems which are related to construction issues there are certain problems which are related to design issues so these kind of things will start coming up over a period of time so but the ones which you know undergo a sale right after building up or uh, they may not see that so you know but there are players in the market as you say the lenders engineers on one side during the construction phase as well as you know there are buyers of the plants at various phases of life this certainly gives them a, you know the access to these data and uh, the kind of due diligence that has gone into the construction they certainly given add in a lot of what you call confidence level of uh, you know uh, an assessment they make about the asset itself like as uh, a plant that has been well built has been uh, i mean what kind of uh, checks and balances were there throughout during the construction or was it just a pace uh, so these do matter i mean uh, for uh, these two communities and whereas the lenders engineers are specifically involved during the construction phase they may be uh, yeah so they are involved during the construction phase they are you know important for the lenders to certify that yeah this is being done and carried forward in a right way but more specifically the asset buyers over a period of time it instills a lot of confidence in them in the kind of data the kind because there is no depth to which you can always go and the more we go uh, it only adds to their confidence level and you know adds value to the asset you know in the in the valuation that's what i would say yeah thanks thanks mr ayer uh, mr devrukkar mr john yeah so how it will be useful for the lenders uh, or the new buyer which will come in that is the question so so the engineering is well established process the engineering records will be straight and the as built drawings everything mostly will be available that is given i think the most important part is uh, the records related to the material testing um, the inspection and the testing reports if they are available and uh, uh, available for the new buyers and the lenders a lot of insight into the quality of the uh, project whether it's an asset which is worth buying and investing uh, second important data is the construction quality so what kind of uh, construction related uh, issues came up through the ncrs and other records you can find out so that in case of a issue later on in the life of the plant you can probably understand why there is an issue in that part of the plant uh, it may be a construction issue or it could be a material issue so those kind of data i think has to be more streamlined in the days to come and that will really help the new buyers and the uh, investors to uh, take an assessment of the asset and uh, take a decision on that that is my view okay. i think uh, nasia has really very nicely actually explained uh, how the lenders and the buyers uh, are really going to be expect uh, expecting it uh, i would just dig down further on that Uh, i think the co- something common between your lenders and your prospective buyers is that they they want a transparency 
they want a confidence which is coming from only transparency and that transparency can come only if you are able to actually provide the data which is not in somebody's file not in somebody's opinion or in head but your your ability to demonstrate that what you are claiming is actually existing is going to be a very very fundamental uh, i think uh, fundamental element which to instill that particular confidence and that would mean during the project life cycle the lenders would, would like to know how how compliant are you to what you have promised are you able to actually complete your construction on time as you uh, you know you are uh, you promised are you actually abiding by the quality that you assured both in terms of the material procurement in terms of the construction quality and very importantly is it all something that they can verify it so i think digitization is going to play a very very important role in terms of instilling those confidence whereas when it comes to someone prospective buyer beyond what we have constructed as it you know as build drawings in terms of you know the entire equipment uh, details and how the architectural design has to take in place they would also like to know as much about the equipment history the performance and the data of of, of you know operating data that has that actually says about some good performing plants versus the not so great performing plants again it's a data which is going to give them the confidence uh, so in both cases uh, the data and the availability of a very transparent data and documents is going to be very very important i remember you know way back uh, i'm talking about those hey days of erp uh, it was always considered that if a the company has got a erp which is established the sale value of the company was always higher because the buyer would get a confidence that your financial accounting and your you know the other things are absolutely transparent they can verify it uh, in a way i think the solar plants will have the same situation with all these digital tools where they say okay do you have a computerized online monitoring system do you have a maintenance system and with a click of a button will i be able to actually see the performance and with a second click can i drill down further and satisfy myself uh, i think those are the kind of things which are really going to be very very important uh, and any amount of digitization automation is definitely going to be uh, making them more confident because the reliance on a skilled manpower is going to go down uh, so i think this is what i think is going to be very very important uh, both for lenders as well as for the potential buyers thanks mr devrakar i think very nicely put uh, and uh, fairly pertinent analogy of erp that you brought in that uh, way back when uh, financial accounting was one of the areas as a metrics for evaluation uh, oracle or uh, sap and all did induce confidence in the buyer that uh, at least the books are uh, we can go back and take a look at the books at any point in time that you want so and i think uh, madam sonia if we can have comments from you and then uh, sir i suppose she had some connectivity issues uh, so she i think she had to leave the webinar okay so i think then we are right on time i would like to really thank each individual speaker uh, mr devrukar mr ayer mr john and ms sonia and rahul thanks thanks for taking time out i think uh, it will surely help uh, all the industry players to take a step forward and with this i hand it over to you sangeeta on behalf of first view media ventures private limited i would like to thank all the speaker panelists for your valuable insight uh, thank you all the attendees for joining us today uh, with this positive note we would like to end today's webinar thank you very much thank thanks. you thank you everyone